Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome, everyone, to the Implementers Podcast, presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because we believe that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, I have a distinguished guest, Dr. Ellen Langer from Harvard University. Dr. Langer is the first woman tenured at Harvard, where she still teaches. And on September 5th, she has a new book being published, A Mindful Body. Welcome, Dr. Langer. Thank you. Dr. Langer, um, in reading the book, something that I found very interesting was a study by Dr. George Engel or George Engel, and it recognizes that biological, psychological, and social factors interact to cause illness. Hence, the mind can affect the body. So business becomes a breeding ground of either good health or poor health of their employees. Can you comment on that? I can indeed. So years ago, the medical model suggested that psychology made no difference at all. The only way one was going to become ill was if there was an introduction of an antigen, a virus, or something of that sort. Then uh, the next model, as you just described, is um, the social model. Now psychology matters somewhat. My work suggests that psychology may be the biggest contributor to our health and well-being. So in The Mindful Body, um, I present lots of research talking about mind-body unity. And the idea is very simple. Uh, You have a mind, you have a body. These are just words. Um, And one could have initially come up with mind, body, and elbows. And then we we think differently about ourselves. I say, let's put the mind and body back together. And if we do that, then wherever we put the mind, we're necessarily putting the body. And we have many studies um, going back many years that show that um, this is actually a very productive way to think of um, of ourselves. And it suggests that our minds control virtually everything. And in companies, um, there's a way that businesses are leading people's minds, and they should take the lead and help everybody become more mindful because in the process, the bottom line will increase exponentially or at least considerably. Okay. So, Dr. Langer, you've spent decades studying and researching mindfulness. Yeah. What is mindfulness? Okay, mindfulness, as we study, it has nothing to do with meditation. You know, meditation is a practice you engage in to result in post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness, um, from my lab, is not a practice. It's just a way of being okay. that, essentially, if you knew that you didn't know, whatever it is before you, you'd Mm -hmm. actively pay attention. Mm -hmm. And what people need to realize is that uncertainty is the rule. It's not the exception. Everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different. So we never know. Mm -hmm. And so we should be paying attention. When we do that, we can take advantage of opportunities to which other people are blind and avoid mishaps. Now, how do you come to appreciate that you don't know? So here's where it is so simple. When, you, when we talk about the effects of doing this, it, it's almost, um, well, it's hard to believe, but 45 mm-hmm. years of research says it's to our advantage to take this work seriously. All you need to do is notice new things. That's all. So if you notice new things about um, your supervisor or your subordinate, you notice new things about your wife, you walk outside, notice new things about the path you've taken to work, every day for the last 20 years, you're going to see new things. As you see those new things, you come to see you didn't know it as well as you thought you did. Mm -hmm. And so your attention naturally goes to it. Now, what all of our research shows is that this act of noticing is literally and figuratively enlivening. So by noticing, the neurons are firing and and we come alive. And um, the research on this mindfulness has been not just for our health. When people are more mindful, we make lots of different populations more mindful, they live longer, 
that's important for uh, curing disease and so on. But people notice, you know, there's some people you think, wow, they're charismatic um, and attractive because of that. And others, they just don't seem to be there. That's because they're mindful. Mm -hmm. So when you're mindful, it improves your relationships. And then we have a series of studies that show that when you do your jobs mindfully, the product actually bears the imprint of this. So you're happier, you're healthier, people like you more, what you do is better. It, and it's so easy. It sort of defies belief for me, once one learns about this, why they don't just make this their way of being in the world. So using what you just mentioned, you become the leader others want to follow. Right. My question would be, why do you think businesses and business leaders have not grasped this and practiced it more in their everyday life? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there are several possible reasons. For one, um, you know, that if everybody is mindful, then I sitting at the top may become less important, mm -hmm. right? You know, that if everybody <laughs> is doing their own thing, uh, the question is, how are we going to get things done? And it turns out that if everybody is mindful, they're all going to be working in concert, not, you know, at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's the power. There's the disbelief um, that, in fact, Joe, you know, for argument's sake, mm -hmm. who I see as not very good, not very smart, um, it's going to take a lot for me to think that, wow, he actually has something to to offer the business. You know, I, I tell a story about, I, I was lecturing in South Africa and I took a day off of, uh, and I was in this very fancy hotel sitting down by the pool. And there was an enormous amount of real estate that the pool had that was totally unused. And the only person who knew this, <laughs> excuse me, was the lowly cabana boy. Nobody, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. a lot of money that mm -hmm. uh, could have been made that wasn't. If only they had respected the uh, knowledge that all of the individual players have. You know, in some sense, everybody knows something. Um, and the some things that they know may be very important to our business. But by having this very clear, I'm on top, you're second, you're third, you're all the way at the bottom, we don't take advantage of what uh, people beneath us might know. Okay. The, a, a, let me just say one other thing, which is that the people on top, interestingly, they know they don't know. Mm -hmm. The problem is that people think they should know. And because, uh, which they shouldn't, because they mm -hmm. can't, because mm -hmm. everything is changing. Mm -hmm. So by thinking you should know, then you run away from the issue rather than address it head on. Mm -hmm. So today in business, there's a fierce intensity of... Uh, change, disruption, and crisis. It's mm -hmm. hitting very hard. Many people don't know how to manage their way through it. So how would you suggest the owner of a business, the manager, the leader of a business would actually guide their people through practicing and recognizing mindfulness as you describe yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I think that business suffer from using yesterday's solutions to solve today's problems. Mm -hmm. um, and governments do that. We do it on an individual level. And so how do you avoid that? Well, you have to notice what today's problems are. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to be in the present. Now, there, you know, people are sweet. They say, be in the moment. Uh, you know, stop it. That is the flag. Right. It's, right. it's really an empty instruction because interestingly, when you're not there, you're not there to know you're not there. Mm -hmm. But all of our research suggests that most of us almost all of the time are not there. Um, once you recognize that you don't know what the best solution is, then what you do is allow people to discover on their own. And by letting uh, people at all levels in the company be active participants in the way the company is going to go forward has many effects, not the least of which is because of their mindful involvement, they're going to be working harder, enjoying it more, and um, producing more of and better of whatever the product tends to be. Yeah. So let's say that an individual wants to bring their employees along. They 
they help them become more mindful of the purpose of the business, the positive in service of, so to speak, what they are doing to help other individuals. But then you reach that block where you say, okay, I'm mindful. I see a lot. Of, I'm curious. Um, I, I see a lot of innovative possibilities out there, but I just don't know what I can control and what I can. So tell us about your research having to do with the illusion of control. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. I worked on the illusion of control. It was the first work I did. So it was forever ago, uh, back in the seventies. And at that point I was stuck in the same frame of mind as I think many people still are thinking that there are rational actions, irrational actions, you know, that we can know what we can control and what we can't control. And that keeps us stuck in the past. And I think that uh, you know, if businesses are afraid, as you started this part of the discussion with, of change, the first thing that everybody has to realize is everything is always changing. Change is not new. And what you don't want to do is continue what you've been doing because you've always done it, because then all the new companies that haven't been doing it forever uh, will now be able to take advantage. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the, the most important part of um, business and life is people get stuck trying to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. And decision making, this is a little complicated, so make sure mm -hmm. I make it clear, okay? okay? That decision making relies on prediction, right? If mm -hmm. I think of this and of that, you know, I'm trying to predict what's going to be best, but prediction is an illusion. And so what businesses have to realize is it almost doesn't matter what the decision is. What you need to do instead of making the right decision, you have to make the decision right. Mm -hmm. And that changes the game uh, completely. You know, um, first, uh, by not worrying about the right decision, which you can't, everything is changing. How can you know what the right decision is? That you reduce the amount of stress that everybody experiences from the top to the bottom. And I believe that stress is the major cause of illness. So if we were to eliminate stress, so the bottom line would increase just by, by virtue of fewer employees getting sick. Um, people would enjoy more of what they were doing at the same time. Now, um, what does that mean that decision making, you know, just randomly mm -hmm. choose anything? That Right now, people believe they should do some cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. to make a decision. And, mm -hmm. you know, so you add them up and say, well, if the costs outweigh the benefits, you go this way, if the benefits, so on and so forth. Um, when you recognize the very simple thing that costs and benefits, positives and negatives, are in our heads, they're not in the world. That means that every cost could be a benefit. Mm -hmm. Every benefit could be a cost. So if mm -hmm. you add it up, it's not going to tell you anything. Mm -hmm. Now, people think they have some idea about this. Uh, they think, you know, so if there are 10 things uh, and six, so they say some of them are going to be good, some of them are going to be bad. But on whole, if there are six positives and four negatives, on whole, it's positive, And that's the direction you should go in. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that everything has some good things and bad. Mm -hmm. I'm saying each and everything is simultaneously good and bad and uh, to equal weight. Mm -hmm. So if we just do this personally and you don't like me because I'm gullible, that's reasonable, but you mm -hmm. may be really fond of me because I'm trusting. Right. Okay. So it's the same thing. I can't bear you because you're so inconsistent, but I adore you because you're, you're so, um, um, no, I just froze. That's okay. <laughs> what, That's what is okay. the word I'm looking for? You're, you're so flexible. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, uh, you may not like me because I'm so gullible. Then you may really care for me because I'm so trusting. I mm -hmm. can't stand you because you're so inconsistent. But then I value you because you're so flexible. Every positive can, in equal way, be a negative. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to go forward that way. And if you look at you know, part of the reason that corporations stay so mindless is the fear of making mistakes. But if you look at how many of these companies have operated, you know, so imagine, remember, there was a very big company, successful company that tried to produce a glue and the glue failed to adhere. Mm -hmm. Now you say, oh my gosh, all the bad decisions that they made, all the mistakes. 
But they didn't stop there. Someone then said, what can I do with a substance that adheres for a short amount of time? Which is different from a glue. That's mm-hmm. very different. You mm-hmm. want it to adhere. And then mm-hmm. they made the post-it note. Mm-hmm. So 3M made far more money, I believe, uh, with a post-it note than they would have with just one other glue. Mm-hmm. Another company made this defogger to save the crops. And the defogger, it turned out, produced an icy, snowy substance. They killed the crops. So again, oh my gosh, all these mistakes. This is what we tried to avoid in business. But on a business decided, no, how can we make good use of this? And they use that very same failed machine to create snow for skiers when Mother Nature doesn't cooperate. Mm-hmm. All right. So once we realize that we can, that we can uh, recontextualize uh, our mistakes to make them failure, we're less afraid of making mistakes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was doing this consulting many years ago for this very big um, power and light company. And when I got there, they had this policy, no mistakes, no accidents, zero accidents. Mm-hmm. And I said to them, all you're doing is increasing lying. Mistakes will be made. And so rather than punish people for mistakes, because then you're also getting rid of all of the innovation that you might experience, mm-hmm. you take that mistake and you turn it inside out as 3M did, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, in your book, you mentioned um, level one, two, three thinking. Level one is where you're naively um, aware that you don't know. Level two is essentially mindlessness. And number three, level three would be you're empowered because um, you have because many alternatives. Exactly. Yeah. Because the you know point, you don't know. Yeah. The point is that level one and level three look the same. Let me give you a simple example. So mm-hmm. let's say uh, somebody drops their cane. And, you know, the person, level one, doesn't care, just, you know, walks away. Mm -hmm. Level two runs in to help. Level three waits a little. Mm -hmm. So they don't help, just like level one. But the reason they're not helping is because they believe this person, if they can pick up the cane themselves, will be better for it. Mm -hmm. All right. So level one and three, both not helping, both look the same, but they're very different. Mm -hmm. You have kids who are uninhibited than the rest of us who are inhibited, and then old folks who, I should put myself in this last category, who might be disinhibited. So it's not that the old person doesn't know the rules, as the young kid doesn't. Mm -hmm. They don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. So again, one in three are very different. And that what happens is we overlook the opportunity to gain a lot of wisdom by every time you see somebody doing something, presuming you know why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. And if you saw it as this level three, there'd be mm-hmm. a way for you yourself to grow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let me take you back now in the mindful body. You yeah. start out by saying that you had an experience where you found out your mother was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. What was that experience like? Well, yeah, it was terrible. I was young. Uh, it was scary. The And it changed my life for many obvious reasons, but mm-hmm. my research life, because what happened is her breast cancer had metastasized to her pancreas. Mm-hmm. And that's the end game, pancreatic mm-hmm. cancer. And then magically, it was just gone. It was just gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I devoted my life to figure out, well, How do we account for these spontaneous remissions? The medical world had no idea. And also people have no idea how, um, how many spontaneous remissions actually occur because so many people don't know they have, let's say, a tumor. So they also don't know that the tumor went away by itself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and people who don't go to the medical world in the first place and those who know and then heal. But it's not top on the list when you think you're going to die and then all of a sudden you're fine to call your doctor and say, ha ha, you were wrong. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that and several other experiences brought me to this mind-body unity idea. So for, for the case with my mother, I presumed that since the medical world had no answer, perhaps it was because 
um, her mind was in a good place. Now, mm -hmm. I had done a study way back when, the first study, Testing Mind-Body Unity, where we took old men to a retreat that we retrofitted to 20 years earlier mm -hmm. and had them live there as if they were their younger selves, speaking mm -hmm. of the past in the present tense. And, you know, it was for them 20 years earlier. Mm -hmm. As a result, without medical intervention, their vision improved, the hearing improved, their memory, their strength, and they look noticeably younger. Mm -hmm. But we know this is an important study because if you to, uh, turn on The Simpsons Go to Havana, they actually describe the study. I was going so, to mention that to you. <laughs> that's when I knew I had made it in this world. But <laughs> we've, we've done so many studies, that, and they're all reported um, you know, in the mindful body since that time, testing my body unity. Let me give you an example. If we take people who have diabetes, um, we have them uh, playing computer games. And the reason for that is we tell them to change the game they're playing every 15 minutes or so. That's just so they'll look at the clock. For a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, half as fast. For a third of the people, real time. And what happens is blood sugar level follows perceived time. We have people in a sleep lab wake up. They think they got more sleep or less sleep than they actually got. Biological and cognitive function follow perceived time. One of the most recent of this that I did with my student, Peter Ungo, um, we inflict a wound. Now, to make this dramatic, it would have been nice for it to be a big wound, but then I'd be in jail right now. So you know, a minor wound, but the theory suggests it should make no difference, small or large. So they, they we give them this wound. They're in front of a clock. The clock, again, is going twice as fast as real time, half as fast as real time, or real time. The wound heals based on perceived time, mm -hmm. not real time. So all of these studies taken together, and there are so many of them, tell me that we have so much more control over our health than most of us realize. Mm -hmm. uh, and that control would basically come from mindfulness, and that is you're curious and you're looking at your life in a creative, curious well, manner. There are, there are two ways. You know, the first, yes, is you're suggesting if we could make companies, people, right from the get-go, uh, mindful, where they're, they're noticing new things, that gives them choices that they otherwise wouldn't have. They recognize that stress is mindless. You know, so they're living a healthy life right from the start. The, so, in effect, they're managing change, disruption, and crisis a exactly, lot better in their own life and in the business. Yeah, but you don't see it as disruption. Right. Because, you know, you're expecting that every day is going to hold something new. Yes. Uh, but these studies, the mind-body unity studies, in a sense, are taking advantage of our mindlessness. You know, mm -hmm. it's like a, the, the strongest medicine out there, I believe, is a placebo. So, think about it. Somebody gives you something that's nothing. <laughs> right, okay, it's mm -hmm. a sugar pill. It's inert mm -hmm. by definition. Mm -hmm. You take it, you think it's medicine, and you get better. So who's making you better? You're making yourself better. And so my life's work is to, to take that control that we're exerting, get rid of the middle person giving you the pill, and essentially helping you help yourself right from, uh, right from the start. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we have an intervention, and again, lots of research on what we call attention to symptom variability. And that's just a fancy way of saying being mindful, noticing change. Right. And when people have a chronic illness, they think it's going to stay the same or just get worse. Nothing only moves in one direction. Whatever your symptoms are, sometimes they're a little better, sometimes they're a little worse. And so what you want to do is be there when it's a little better or a little worse and say why. And mm -hmm. then you can intervene. And so what we've done is we call people periodically throughout the day, throughout the week, and just ask them, how is it now? And is it better or worse than before? And why? Mm -hmm. The search for why is mindful, which we've mm -hmm. just said now many times, itself is good for your health. But mm -hmm. it's also the case that if you're looking for a solution, you're much more likely to find it. Mm -hmm. So we've done these studies on attention to symptom variability with big, big uh, disorders, multiple sclerosis, stroke, uh, Parkinson's, um, uh, chronic pain, arthritis, you know, lots of big things. And in each case, we get phenomenal results 
without, again, medical intervention. If you need medical intervention, get medical intervention. I'm not, you know, anti Mm -hmm. uh, getting help. It's just we can do so much more for ourselves. Now, Mm -hmm. so the question you might ask is, well, I'm trying to get people to be able to do this without anybody else's help, but here we're calling them. But you could set your smartphone, ring in an hour, and ask yourself the question, well, how do I feel now? Is it better or worse than before, and why? Then set it for two hours, and then, you know, a half hour, and so on. And by doing this, um, people uh, seem to be able to figure out um, how to improve. So let's say that you're suffering from major stress, and you think you're stressed all the time. And mm-hmm. then you do this. You may discover you're only stressed when you're talking to Ellen Langer. Okay, good. Then the solution is easy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I still want to talk to you. Anyway, okay, good. <laughs> I have used that idea in our everyday work. We, we coach and guide individuals on how to better run a business. And I explained the idea of mindfulness. So what I've done is periodically had them do exactly what you say. Set your iPhone or set your, cl- your phone to um, notify you periodically throughout the day. And when you're in a meeting, how did you feel? What were your reactions? Good. And I found it's a natural way to lead somebody into mindfulness because they're fascinated by the insights that they get about themselves. Yeah. So they start questioning and the curiosity takes over. No, that's perfect. It's also the case, you know, interpersonally, you know, that you have a worker or a spouse, whoever, that you think, oh, they're such whatever you have. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and as if they're old, you're always so stubborn. Nobody mm-hmm. is always anything. Mm-hmm. And by becoming more mindful, aware of when they are, when they aren't, you say that, well, gee, um, just like you, their behavior changes depending on the context, and then relationships improve. And when every, as silly as it, well, I don't know, it sounds silly, but as simple as it might sound, when people are happy, they perform better. Right. And again, since these are businesses that we're concerned with right now, when people's performance increases, bottom lines. So what happened to me is when I started doing this and doing more introspection, if you will, of myself and tracking the metrics of my feelings, if I can Mm -hmm. use that term, I really got the insight that I was becoming more curious. And when I became curious and creative, I was happier. And it led me to your book on becoming an artist. And what I found in that book then was my life is really designed by me and it's an art and I am an artist in doing that. So that enabled me then to transfer this to other individuals. And I have to say to you, it is a significant difference in behaviors that I'm observing and they're seeing. And there are people that made 180 degree turnarounds in how they're managing people. And now people actually look at them as the leader they want to follow. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, I (laughs) think that the most important thing for people to realize is they don't know. Mm-hmm. And when they don't know, you listen to people, mm-hmm. you know, and then other people feel listened to mm-hmm. and the relationship changes and relationships are not an unimportant part of successful businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I also mentioned, and you might find this interesting, you mentioned like your research, the effects you've had on treating Parkinson's disease, right. et cetera. I use that. And then I say, it makes changing or improving a business sound pretty easy doesn't it (laughs) in comparison but it is all in our own mind so what i want to do is just close if i can with a couple of quotes from your books and just get a simple idea and maybe you can explain it a little further in this one you say when we stop experiencing ourselves we end up treating ourselves as um as objects of evaluation could you elaborate on that a little more yeah um you can either be an experiencing self or an evaluating self. If you're going to be evaluating yourself, you have to hold the self still. Mm -hmm. If you're an experiencing self, the self keeps growing. And I think that evaluation itself is mindless. It's mindless for, it's mindless for several of the reasons we already pointed out that Mm -hmm. when you're evaluating yourself or somebody else, was it a level three or a level one? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. um, when we're being negative, we think it's a level one, but maybe there was good reason for it. Mm-hmm. That when you're experiencing yourself, you're noticing things. And as you're noticing things, you're growing, you're lighting up as a person. So you become more attractive to everybody around you. And most important, you're going to see 
new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Now, when businesses or people are uh, sealed and unlived lives, they act as if they know this is the way. And um, as soon as they do that, they stop growing. Mm -hmm. And the business is as soon, probably sooner than one would think, is going to be surpassed by a business that doesn't think they know. Not Mm -hmm. knowing is the key. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have to exploit the power and uncertainty. And too many people uh, run from uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have one other quote in here. It says, to be truly mindful, it would behoove us to engage or experience something outside of or other than ourselves. Well, one could, I I don't remember when I said that, but Mm -hmm. it sounds Mm -hmm. sounds like it's very wise. (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, means you that, said it, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I think that it's because of the way many of us think of ourselves that um, it's not uh, examining how you do things with the intention of how can I improve it. It's usually evaluative, taking mm-hmm. yourself or somebody else apart, which serves no purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're looking at the world out uh, in front of you, let's say you're just looking at performance of people, mm-hmm. that if you're stuck in your mindsets, this is how you do it, then you mm-hmm. can say, oh, this person is no good. They're not doing it this way. If you recognize that the way to do something was just a set of decisions made at an earlier time, uh, not handed down from the heavens, so that there are always new and better ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. And so then the present um, is setting you up for the future rather than just mindlessly continuing with, with what you did in the past. You know, there's something else. I, I have a one-liner. I don't think I've mm-hmm. ever told you this, but I love this mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. I have a book. Um, it's called The Art of Noticing, which is just my paintings paired with mm-hmm. one-liners that were culled from uh, my research over the years. Mm-hmm. People find this one useful. Ask yourself, is it a tragedy or an inconvenience? Mm-hmm. And that most of the time when something happens, whether it's in business or your personal life, it's rarely tragic. Mm-hmm. You know, um, somebody didn't finish the product when they were supposed to, you missed the buzz, whatever. As soon as you ask yourself this, you calm down. And then after you calm down and realize it's an inconvenience, there's yet another step which is how to make that work for you. Mm-hmm. you know, so when you master the sorts of things that, I'm, uh, that you and I are teaching people, there's a tendency to fall up mm-hmm. rather than fall down. Mm-hmm. That whatever happened that seems, oh my gosh, um, you know, it's a tragedy, turns out to be a, a very good thing where mm-hmm. you're in a better place than you would have been had it not occurred in the first place. Mm-hmm. So I want to share one story with you that happened in my life. When I was seven years old, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. The impact on me was significant. Yeah. What it did for me is it triggered a fascinating journey in that I became a salesperson, I guess you would say, because I made a deal with God. I said, if you give me my mother, I'll be the best person I can be the rest of my life. To make the story shorter, a long story shorter, my mother was 42 years old at the time. And as I watched in every, say, six months, I'd say, she made it this far. I think she's going to make it further. She ended up living to 100 years old. Oh, my goodness. How wonderful. She turned 100 years old on a Friday and died the following Monday. But her goal was, I want to live to 100. So what that did for me, and here's the final quote that I want to mention to you. We are, where we are is where we've never been. It helped me through my mother's experience live every day, one day at a time, and experience the curiosity and the fascination, fascination with life. Yeah, that... Everything is new. Mm-hmm. And if it's new, it's potentially exciting. And I think that new and uncertain, unknown scare people because they think they should know. And um, so it's freeing to realize mm-hmm. that nobody can know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it also makes you very powerful. You know, mm-hmm. You're talking to somebody who's very full of themselves. You know that they don't know. We don't know if they know they don't know, but there are questions you can ask to reveal that. Mm -hmm. You can do it nicely. Um, Yeah, I think that um, what what we need to appreciate is that 
not knowing is exciting. And you can do what some people do, which is live each day as if it's your last or live each day as if it's your first. Exactly. Or just live each day, <laughs> you know, and- uh, without knowing um, what to expect and not being scared because whatever happens is going to be appreciated by us depending on the way we understand it. If we understand it is stressful, tragic, awful, clearly that's the way we're going to experience it. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's certainly not our only option. Um, you know, I think I said to you the last time we spoke, and I should come up with different examples. It's kind of ridiculous, but this one <laughs> sticks for me that, you know, if you and I go out for lunch and the food is great, wonderful, it's a win. Mm-hmm. If you and I go out for lunch and the food is awful, wonderful, I'll eat less and that'll be better for my waistline. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, so uh, and if as if we're talking to adults, all of us, you know, over the age of 45, certainly, and, and many of your CEOs are far older than that, we've all experienced things that have happened that worried us, scared us. And if you look back at them and you say, wow, you know, it's a good thing that happened because it set the stage for this next thing. Yes. Um, then we become less afraid of these so-called negative experiences, and then we get to write the script any way we want. Yes. So, Dr. Langer, um, your book, September 5th, is coming out, The Mindful Body, and what I would suggest, please read the book, everybody, because the lessons that you learn about creating a mindful body also apply to business and creating a good, healthy business. So again, Dr. Langer, thank you very, very much for your time here. This was my pleasure. Thank you. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with GuideWise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.